One of the re reasons Christians should accept the Quran is because the Bible commands you to. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse number 18, God speaks about raising a prophet from the brethren of the Israelites who will be like Moses, and he will also be a mouthpiece for God. And any person who does not listen to this prophet will be destroyed. This prophecy was not fulfilled before Jesus, as the Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament confirm. Moreover, Jesus cannot be this prophet, as Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse number 10 says, And there shall never arise again in Israel a prophet like unto Moses. And since Jesus was from amongst Israel, he is ruled out. Moreover, Jesus himself said that this prophet will come after him. And John chapter 14, 15 and 16, Jesus speaks of someone to come after him who will testify to who he is. If you read the text carefully, you can see that this person is in fact the prophet like Moses, who shall speak what he hears and shall be told what to say, which doesn't sound like a Holy Ghost is 100% God. Christians claim this text is regarding the Holy Ghost, but it's clear that it's not the Holy Ghost. Also, did the Holy Ghost guide Christians into all truth and testify regarding Jesus? The answer is no, as any book on church history shows that Christians were at each other's throats for centuries upon centuries, trying to figure out things like, was Jesus just a man, or was he just God, or was he both? Was he the Father, or was he a separate person? Was he subordinate to the Father, or was he co-equal? And the list goes on. And I've got church father quotes to confirm that. Whereas when the Quran was revealed, it gave a clear, concise, and coherent picture of who Jesus was, and Muslims are agreed across the board. We didn't argue with each other for centuries trying to figure out who Jesus is, like the Christians. Another reason why you should accept what the Quran has to say on the matter is that modern biblical scholarship seems to understand Jesus as being closer to the image that Islam portrays as opposed to Christianity. Scholars such as E.P. Sanders and Geza Vermis confirm that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet who never claimed divinity. Bar Ehrman on page 60 of his book called Forged writes the following, Many scholars have thought of the early church as seriously divided. On one side were the Jewish followers of Jesus, such as his brother James, who was head of the um, church in Jerusalem, and a disciple Peter. On the other side were people like the Apostle Paul, who you Christians follow, who focus on converting Gentiles. In this modern Shema, James and Peter are often taught to be more true to Jesus' original message, that it was the God of Israel who had brought salvation to those who kept his teachings as found in the Jewish law. For these early Christians, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people in fulfillment of the Jewish law. So they didn't believe he was God. I will now move on to my third point regarding why there are differences regarding who Jesus is. The Quran gives a simple reason in Surah 4, Ayah 171, where it commands the Jews and Christians, in this um, case um, regarding exaggerating about Jesus, it tells the Jews and Christians not to exaggerate regarding Jesus. So Islam claims that the reason why Christians believe Jesus is God is due to centuries of exaggeration by his followers. The question is, when did this exaggeration start? I'm going to leave Paul aside for a moment, and I might touch up on him in the rebuttals, but I'm going to stick to the Gospels for now. Biblical scholarship mentions that Mark was the first Gospel to be written around the year 70 CE, with Matthew and Luke copying from Mark and changing things to improve the image of Jesus around the years 80 to 85 CE. So they couldn't have been disciples if they had to copy from Mark, who was not a disciple. And the Gospel of John was written between 90 CE to 110 CE. It's amazing that if one moves from Mark, the earliest Gospel in the New Testament, to John, the last to be written, one can see a clear evolution in the image of Jesus. For example, noted biblical scholar William Barclay, in his book Daily Bible Studies on the Gospel of Matthew, page 2, says the following, and I quote, Since Matthew and Luke are much longer than Mark, it might just possibly be suggested that Mark is a summary of Matthew and Luke, but there is one other set of facts which show that Mark is earlier. It is the custom of Matthew and Luke to improve and polish Mark. So Matthew and Luke improved the word of God. If we may put it so, let us take some instances. Sometimes Mark seems to limit the power of Jesus. At least an ill-disposed critic might try to prove that he was doing so. So I must be the ill-disposed critic tonight. Let us see some examples of improvements or changes in the image of Jesus. In Mark chapter 6, verse 5 to 6, 
regarding Jesus doing miracles, it says, And he could do no mighty work there, and he marveled because of their unbelief. So Jesus couldn't do a miracle uh, because of the people's unbelief. But the same story in Matthew chapter 13, verse 58 says, And he did not do many mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. So in Mark, he couldn't do it. In Matthew, who improved on Mark, he didn't do it. So he could have if he wanted to, but he chose not to. William Barclay says, Matthew shrinks from saying that Jesus could not do any mighty works and changes the form of expression accordingly. So Matthew had an issue with the fact that Jesus wasn't all powerful, so he changed the text. And you can all read Mark chapter 6, verse 5 to 6, and compare it with Matthew chapter 13, verse 58. Here's another example. In Mark chapter 10, a man walked up to Jesus and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. But if you go to the same story in Matthew chapter 19, instead of Jesus saying, why do you call me good? Instead he says, why do you ask me about what is good? So we see that once again, Matthew was embarrassed by the statement of Jesus when he denied that he was ultimately good as God is. Thus he cannot be God. What about Mark chapter 5 verse 30? As Jesus was walking, a woman comes behind him who's been bleeding for 12 years and she touches Jesus and she's healed. So Jesus turns around because he noticed power had left him. And he starts asking his disciples, who touched me? Who touched me? And they said to him, we don't know who touched you. There's a whole crowd around you. So Jesus is looking around trying to figure out who touched him. And then the woman tells him, it was me who touched you. Now the same story in Matthew chapter 9, rather than looking around all confused and ignorant, uh, where, where is, uh, who touched me? Instead, Jesus turns around straight away, looks at the woman and says, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. So what did Matthew do once again? He improved the so-called word of God, the gospel of Matthew, by changing the image of Jesus. So if any Christian tries to explain away the text in Mark, they should first explain why Matthew was embarrassed by it and he changed it. So this is a problem when Christians think they can just quote from the New Testament to try to prove who Jesus is, when it's clear that the New Testament writers were willing to change the biography of Jesus in order to make it conform to their own beliefs. So rather than modify their beliefs to conform to scripture, instead they will modify scripture to conform to their beliefs. This is one of the main reasons Muslims will not accept the gospels at face value, but instead we like to see what biblical scholarship has to say on the matter. So Richard will have to tell us whether he accepts what biblical scholars are saying, that there was an evolution and exaggeration of Jesus as time went on. If Richard denies this, then he should explain why Matthew kept changing Mark. If you thought the changes from Mark to Matthew seemed to improve the image of Jesus, then it would be interesting to see how the image of Jesus changes drastically when you go from Mark, Matthew, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, to the last Gospel, which is John. In this Gospel, far from being the humble prophet and Messiah of the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus is instead almost exaggerated to the level of God, although even in John, Jesus still seems to fall short of being God. This explains why Christians seem to quote John a lot to prove that Jesus is God. I have a quote here from E.P. Standers in his book, The Historical Figure of Jesus. Muhammad, uh, who claimed to be receiving revelations uh, from God. And according to Muslims, these revelations to Muhammad are what we now have written down in the Quran. Now the Quran has no historical credibility with regard to Jesus' life on earth, having been written so late in such an isolated location. So a fundamental question for tonight's debate is this. Which source do you trust? Here are the cho two choices. A, accounts from within the circle of eyewitnesses, friends and family of Jesus that were formalized within 20 to 40 years of Jesus' death. Or B, writings made hundreds of miles away in Arabia 600 years later among people who couldn't even have read the original reports. My answer to that question is A, Zakia must answer that question B. When the Quran was written, there was no translation of the Gospels into Arabic, so Muhammad got what knowledge he had of Jesus from the few local Christians that he met. And they were far from the centers of the Christian faith. And their understanding of Christianity uh, was often quite patchy um, uh, and some inconsistencies in it. In his early ministry, Muhammad hoped the Jews and Christians would endorse his prophethood, but they didn't. And as Muhammad's uh, prophecies went on, they became more and more critical of Jews and Christians, and he began to rewrite biblical stories differently, changing them. 
partly through his patchy knowledge of the biblical accounts and partly to fit in with his own developing Islamic theology. If Muhammad wanted to present himself as God's most significant prophet, then Jesus needed downgrading. But I'd like to have a look a little bit about the Quran's track record of dealing with uh, biblical stories. And I'll start with just a couple of illustrations from the Old Testament. But the first one, when the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Quran reports that God lifted Mount Sinai, held it above the heads of the Israelites, and then put it back in its place. Now, the accounts we have in the Bible in Exodus, obviously that's not recorded. That doesn't sound to me like the sort of thing people might have omitted from their account. That sounds quite a dramatic incident. So how on earth has that got into the Quran? How, how did that story end up in the Quran? Well, we know where that story came from. That story uh, was made up uh, as part of Jewish folklore in the intervening centuries. So that was a pre-existing story that someone had made up, was written down, and it's now in the Quran. Why is that in the Quran? Okay, number two, the, um, the Quran rewrites the story of Abraham. There's quite a bit to that. I'll just give you a few, a few um, aspects of it. The Quran says that Abraham and Ishmael rebuilt the Kaaba. Now, the Kaaba is the black cube at the center of Islamic worship uh, in Mecca. There's no record of that anywhere outside the, the Quran, no historical record of that. But then uh, Muhammad said that that had happened. Uh, Muhammad changed the, the Quran changes the story about Abraham being instructed by God to sacrifice Isaac. The Quran changes it and says that Abraham was actually instructed to sacrifice Ishmael. Now, you may know many Muslims believe uh, that Ishmael was the father of the Arabic race. Muhammad changed the story uh, to, to reflect that. Now, looking at those stories, there was no previous record of them. You can either believe that God revealed those things to Muhammad in um, the 7th century, or you could believe that they seem to have been created with a purpose of backing up um, Islamic theology and supporting uh, the views that Muhammad was trying to promote. Let's move on to the New Testament. Uh, now, when Mary, the Jesus, uh, mother of Jesus, is introduced in the Quran, she's described as the sister of Aaron. Now, the sister of Aaron was called Miriam and obviously lived 1,400 years earlier, which just seems a clear mistake. Now, Muhammad didn't have access to written records of the Bible. He just picked up things from local Christians. It's quite understandable uh, that he might have got mixed up. Uh, like that. I'm quite willing to accept that. In the Quran, we also find this story. Uh, the baby Jesus speaks from the cradle as a baby and says this, according to the Quran, I am indeed a servant of Allah. He's given me the book and appointed me a prophet. He's made me blessed wherever I may be and has enjoined upon me prayer and almsgiving. Right, the idea of Jesus teaching from, uh, speaking from the cradle, that's not in any of the Gospels. That's not mentioned in any of the, uh, of the accounts from the time. Where does that come from? How did that in get into the Quran? Well, there was a document called the Arab Infancy Gospel, written in the 5th or 6th century. And so written before, you know, well before the time of Muhammad um, in Arabic. And that included a story of Jesus speaking from the cradle. So it's quite plausible that Muhammad could have come across that story. And then we find it in the Quran. The story is slightly changed in the Quran. The original story, Jesus didn't say, I'm a servant of Allah. Jesus said, I am Jesus, the Son of God, the Logos, who you have brought forth as the angel Gabriel announced to you. And my Father has sent me for the salvation of the world. But perhaps that didn't fit uh, with Muhammad's purposes. Now, if you look at what Jesus is proposed to have said in the Quran, it's clearly a reflection of Islamic theology. And the prayer and almsgiving, the words used, that's reflecting uh, what are known.